70 years ago, something special started. Formula One. Man and machine in perfect unison. Pushing each other to their limits. Supported by teams aiming for that top step. Well, the name of the game is winning. Seeking perfection. The road hasn't always been smooth. We've marveled at great moments. Had smiles brought to our faces. <laughs> Cried with our heroes. Witnessed incredible bravery. And terrible sadness. Moments never to be forgotten. For 70 years, this has been their Everest. This is what makes them special. This is the story of Formula One. I surprise people by telling them, actually, I've never really liked cars. And, uh, of course, they, they don't believe me. Ron Dennis is one of the real Formula One trailblazers. What I do love is I love making things. And I am fiercely competitive. So, Formula One provided the perfect opportunity to be in an extremely competitive world and make beautiful things. Because uh, you know, whilst not every Grand Prix car has uh, been uh, aesthetically beautiful, they are normally made very, very well. Ron is famous for attention to detail. By the way, a lot of senior people in motor racing are. Jackie Stewart, famously, was and is. Bernie Ecclestone, famously, was and is. You know, David Richards, Flavio Briatore, all of these people like presentational perfection, otherwise known as OCD, and Ron will admit that. I think in today's language, I am uh, compulsive obsessive, and I have always been that way, but mine is sort of, sits in my mind where it won't stop analysing, seeking perfection, trying to find a better way to do things, but uh, at the same time, in an environment of phenomenal order. If you open any cupboard in my home, every can is completely aligned and uh, with the labels pointing to the front. It was attention to detail. Um, I, I mean, you know, everything had to be done just right. Um, I think he'd met Roger Penske, actually, and saw the way Roger did things, ran his team, um, and you could see that Ron was sort of picking up on that uh, and, and saying that, you know, there's no excuse for failure. I wouldn't be here without Roy Salvadori. No question. No question at all. For lots of reasons, but, you know, that was the guy that gave me the chance. That was the guy that nurtured me. That was the guy that explained things and gave me a compass heading that I followed all my life. Well, I'd known Ron a long time because he had come into Formula Two uh, in 71 with a, a, an outstanding visual, if you want to call it, uh, operation, Rondell Racing, and he had two Brabham BT 36, and they were the best prepared. The scale of what Ron had created backed he had got backers who gave him the funds to do this. Rondell Racing was unofficially the Brabham Formula 2 team. Ron sat me down one day and said, listen, I'd like you to come and look after sponsorship and that sort of stuff, and I'll pay you £10 a week. I've got to be fair, you know, without Ron Taranak agreeing to loan me two cars, a few other things falling into place, I would have never succeeded. At that point, McLaren, they were going through a very dark phase. In 1979, their ground effect car, which should have been the dominant car, turned out to be a McLaren, which was an M28. It was probably one of the worst cars. 
that McLaren factory has ever produced. Marlborough, who were the principal backers of the McLaren team, were concerned that McLaren had lost the plot totally. I tried to convince them to uh, drop the sponsorship of McLaren and sponsor my team. The board came back and said, no, uh, it's not going to happen. I phoned up John Hogan. I said, look, you know, I have an idea. Why don't I buy McLaren? And he said, what do you mean? You know, uh, how, how are you going to buy McLaren? I said, well, I said, if you told them that you weren't going to sponsor them unless they sold to me, and let's say they sell half to me, then maybe they would be faced with you know, no other alternative. So once Ron became a part of the team and John Barnard came with a technical uh, sort of knowledge there's going to be a commitment to a construction method which had never, ever been used in Formula One previously. Because of the ground effect, one way of improving it was to make your ground effect wings wider, bigger, so you've got more surface area, more downfalls. Uh, to get that, I had to narrow the chassis. And by narrowing the chassis as much as I did, I lost would have lost a, a torsional stiffness and general bending stiffness of the chassis. So I thought, how can I put that back? I need another material. I thought about maybe I should make a, instead of a, a, an aluminium skin monocoque, I'll make a steel skin monocoque. But then weight was an issue and so on. And then I got, uh, I got a phone call from uh, Steve Nichols, who I knew from my IndyCar time. He told me he was developing a new car for Project 4 wanted a stiff, narrow monocoque for the ground effect uh, type of cars that were in existence then. But, and he said he was, uh, wanted to use an innovative new material for, to add stiffness, and uh, but he couldn't get anybody in England to build it for him. And so I said, well, I guess you're talking about carbon fiber then, and I might be able to help you, because I used to work at Hercules, and we used carbon fiber in the rocket motor. Um, rocket motors for the Trident missile system. We duly arrived at Hercules Aerospace and with a sort of smoke and mirrors performance convinced them uh, that on the basis that no one in the world ever had heard the company because everything they did was top secret that this would be a project that they could proudly be associated with and that they would get some reflected uh, benefit. And so we forged an amazing relationship and um, the early examples of the, the chassis weren't particularly cosmetically pleasing, but they were unbelievably torsionally strong, so stiff. And uh, you know, that just became the catalyst to the entire success of McLaren. The design was the car that then became McLaren MP41. It became, in effect, the template for what Formula One would go on to do. I needed to choose someone when I considered uh, Nicky. And I phoned him out of the blue and said, you know, Nicky, why don't you come back? Nicky didn't say yes or no, he just said, okay. And of course, it was very quickly on the pace. And um, so the rest is history, as they say. It was the toughest guy to beat, as far as I know. The toughest guy, so therefore, this championship is the most important one for me. Portuguese Grand Prix 1984 was um, memorable, <laughs> to say the least. Prost was unbelievably positive in defeat. We had one unbelievable party that evening. Uh, and of course, ironically, the World Championship was decided by half a point because of the race in Monte Carlo. I think Ron is the most visionary person I've, I've worked with. Uh, you know, he's a guy that you can have a conversation with and leave the room and feel, you know, truly, truly motivated to, to go. You know, m most of us, you know, if we're lucky, we look like that at things. Uh, too often we look down there, Ron, you know, Ron looks, he's right up there. When I first started with, with, uh, with Ron at McLaren, I came up to being manager of small teams like ATS, Theodore Racing and Shadow. I was always balancing 
the money. So when I got to McLaren and Ron said, if you want something that's going to make the car faster, buy it. Don't care how much it costs. Don't you ever worry about money. I worry about money. You get the best for the team. Wow, that was just like a breath of fresh air. I look back on that race in Adelaide. It wasn't bad luck. It was a bad decision. They didn't stop for tyres, and you know the the tyre failure was not the result of a of a puncture. It was a it was worn out, and uh, they just took the wrong decision about uh, how they managed their tyres and and when they changed. So I think that they, you know that uh, they lost the world championship, but at the same time we won it not because of their bad luck, but because of our uh, better decisions. Looking back on it, of course, it was that, I don't know, moment of vindication for John and for myself for taking that really adventurous step into the world of carbon fibre and of course now not only every Formula One car but most competitive cars uh, you are much better heavily strapped into a survival cell than any other uh, type of accident. The best thing about Oyeton was intelligence and rationality. So much as he had the odd Brazilian flare up, you could have amazingly deep uh, conversations with him. And, you know, I, I think I understood him uh, better than anybody else ever on the planet because I was in a period of his life which was the most intense period of his life, all the success of his life. And I saw him wrestle with uh, things that never came to the surface because they weren't things that were directly ta taking place in, the, in, in within Grand Prix racing. It was very much things that happened in his private life that I managed to help him with both as a friend but also as someone that I felt mentored him well through some of the crises in his life. The most important thing to all of us is to keep the good moments and I had a tremendous time, you know, the records tell, speak for themselves, the results, the championships. And I leave friends behind, and I think that's the best way to do it. Leaving friends behind, winning, last race, coping in an extremely difficult season with the technical reasons that we all know, and winning five races, it is tremendous. <laughs>